and welcome to our presentation on the use of EHRs in long-term care. I'm Lisa Wynn and Ashley Wells is here with me and today we're going to just have an overview, a brief overview of what we're doing with long-term care here in Oklahoma, some of the projects we're working on. We'll look particularly at one that is funded by the Oklahoma State Department of Health um, in medication safety in long-term care environments um, and in that project we've looked at uh, homes that are nursing homes that are using EHRs and so we want to share with you what we're seeing are some of the most commonly implemented EHRs in those facilities how they're using those EHRs and some lessons learned and recommendations so hopefully at the end of this presentation you'll be able to state at least two EHRs that are in use in our long-term care facilities uh, state at least three ways that they are using these EHRs and maybe a couple of issues that they're having with EHRs. So let me first uh, tell you briefly about the work that we have done in Oklahoma with long-term care and projects on quality improvement. We've been working with uh, nursing homes since 2002, that's almost 14 years, and we've worked with over 200 homes in our state. Most of these are projects that were either funded by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and or our Oklahoma State Department of Health. They are projects that were focused in improvement in specific quality measures, such as improving pressure ulcers, um, implementing culture change, applying a quality assessment process improvement principles. And these projects have included our on-site technical assistance with the homes and in the homes, uh, and regional and virtual educational conferences, and creation or providing a many different tools and resources as part of those projects. So our current projects uh, with long-term care are funded through Oklahoma State Department of Health. There are two of them. Um, and the funding comes from the Civil Monetary Penalties Funds from CMS. And one of these projects is to improve healthcare acquired conditions. And the other is improving medication safety in that we're working with 8 to 12 homes and today's presentation is going to focus on the medication safety project. So our med safety project, we are currently in year two. We're working with eight homes. Um, year three will start uh, by the end of this month into next month and we'll get additional four homes. So we'll be working with 12. And what this project focuses on is comparing EHR versus non-EHR use in the medication administration process. So we want to observe those two different processes and see how they compare and contrast and how they help the home with their medication administration. And in this project we are partnering with the Oklahoma University College of Pharmacy. So some of the project roles the OU Co-op, they come in to do any medication review. So if you have a new new admin or you have any residents that you want a medication review on, they can come in and do a med rec for that resident to assess their medications and see if there's any changes that need to be made. They are also able to come in and provide staff, edu staff education. So they can pro provide education on any medications that your team needs to learn. They also provide direct intervention and project data collection. And at OFMQ, our role is to come in and analyze the workflow. So we look at the use of an electronic health record versus a non-use. Um, we assess their workflow, see how they um, implement their medication administration from beginning to end. We compile a statistical analysis and then we also come back and make any recommendations and report findings to the homes. So for this project, these are the different EHRs we have encountered so far. We had one home working with Care Tracker and AOD. We had one home on Health Medex, five homes on Point Click Care, and one home on Voro Health. 
So what I'd like to go over is what we found out with workflows, particularly related to when a resident comes into the home and how we gather information about their medications, how that gets into the EHR, and how those medications get administered to the resident. So we start with a patient that's either coming into the home as a new resident or through a uh, readmission, meaning they were already a resident in the home, they went to the hospital and they came back. And so when they come into the home, they're going to have what we call mission orders and that's going to include a list of medications. And that list can either come electronically, more than likely it's going to come as a uh, a stack of paper uh, with the patient and so the admitting nurse gets those medication orders and um, if they have an EMR they enter them into the electronic medical record um, and if they don't it's entered into their paper chart. The uh, comparison then has to occur between both records so um, if especially if they're readmission, the medications they were on when they were a resident originally could be different as they come back from the hospital with their list of new orders. And so the nurse needs to look at that and reconcile if there are any discrepancies, if some medications might have not made it back on the list that they need to be on. It, it's a fairly complicated process. And so uh, they need to get that list of medications reordered at the pharmacy. So the pharmacy, so that can go various ways again, depending on if they have an EHR, if it's connected to an HIE. So that could go electronically. It could go uh, more than likely. It's going to go by fax. Uh, then the next thing that occurs is the uh, once the pharmacy fills that medication then the um, certified medication aid um, will look those medications up in the EHR. If they have an EHR or they'll look at a paper medication administration record and document the medications that they are about to give to the patient or the resident. Um, and then they will dispense those medications and in a minute Ashley is going to actually show you um, some of the equipment used for that and what that looks like. Now I've had this big old process and this is the first time I've mentioned the physician because often the physician doesn't enter this process uh, until up to a week after the resident has been admitted because they make rounds on the resident weekly. So the, the resident could come in on a, uh, let's say, a Wednesday afternoon, and it is not until the following week on Tuesday when the physician makes their rounds on the resident. So that is sort of a hiccup sometimes we have in the process. Uh, the physician will come in and find out that things are not right with the medications and they'll need to make changes. And so how that communication happens between the physician and the nursing home and the pharmacy uh, is sometimes done virtually and it's sometimes done over the phone. It's sometimes done through the paper process. And um, what we have found is even though a nursing home may have an EHR, they may not have spent the money on the module for the physician to be able to ac access the EHR remotely. So again, they have to wait for a week for the physician to physically be in the building to sign off on orders. So it's, it really becomes a very complex and complicated workflow process and each home has a different workflow. Talking about the workflows, we observed various workflows for medication administration. In this picture, this is actually a medication room. So you can see that she's at her cart getting the resident's medication ready and they're utilizing an EHR. So during this process, she'll pull up the resident's name and medication list in the EHR, compile all of the medication and any necessary supplies like water, um, applesauce, etc to give to the resident and she'll go take that 
medication to that resident and then come back and document that it was given in the EHR. So in this home, the medication process was all conducted in the medication room. So each resident's medication was filled, given to the resident, and then the next one comes. So the EHR comes in place for this home. Just they don't have to use any paper. There's no paper binder. It's all electronic. And as many of you know, this is the medication card. So these are all stored in a locked drawer on the med cart. You can see at the t in the top right corner, there's the resident's name and then the medication. So this is used to verify with either the paper medication chart or the EHR. They can compare these two to make sure that the correct medication is given to the correct resident. And as I mentioned, they're all stored in a locked drawer. In this home, they actually had a med cart. So this med cart is used to roll down each hallway, and some even use this to go to each resident's room. They make sure before they start the medication process that they have all necessary supplies. So you can see that they have their cups, their medic little medication cups, they have their little water jar and any ne other necessities they need. And at this home, you can see they have a, the little red binder. They don't utilize an EHR, so they use this binder for each resident. It will show the resident's name. They often have the resident's picture on the, on the little paper as well. And then it shows each medication and the dosage um, when they need this medication. And the med aide or whoever's administering the medication will sign off. So um, in this process, it's different with each home, like I mentioned, they'll either go room to room or if it's breakfast time, they'll go push the car out into the dining area and then they'll find each resident one by one. So I, I wanted to add, um, this cart process is probably used in most of the homes and for those that have an EHR, the only difference is they'll have the laptop usually on the medication cart and will do their documentation on the laptop. They'll, they'll get the medication for that resident ready in, in the little pill cups with their water or whatever. They'll lock the EHR and then they'll go to the resident to give the medications. Then when they come back, they unlock the laptop and finish their documentation. And also in um, some of the homes, they will even have a little um, my mind just went blank. A little iPad. They'll have it mounted to the med cart, and that way it's a touch screen. They can just come up and instead of having to type or click, they can just use the touch screen and also lock it when they are walking away. So these are just um, some of the EHRs that we've encountered and what they use them for. So you can see. Um, how many homes use their EHR for med order. You can see um, how many homes use it for medication administration. We had about half that use it and half that don't. And one thing to remember on this, um, some homes use it more than others just depending on the cost and what, what modules you want to pay for versus which ones you don't. Um, you can see about half used it to have the physician sign off. And this again, it's a, some EHRs require an extra cost to have this module. So some homes, they still have their physician signing off on paper and then we'll scan those into the electronic health record. And we had about two have a direct connect to the pharmacy. And then we only had one connected to an HIE. And one thing to remember about an HIE is this is where the patient, the patient or resident's information is directly sent to any healthcare setting. So if you have a resident that's admitted to the hospital, that hospital is able to pull up that resident's information without having to have the record scanned or sent to them. And on the direct connect to the pharmacy, you think of that just like e-prescribing. It's, it's a literal electronic connection. Those that don't have that or haven't paid for that additional module, um, if they have the medications in their EMR, 
uh, they can print out of the EMR and then walk it over to a fax machine and fax it to the pharmacy. So some EHR benefits that we observed, some of the homes have pointed out what they really like about their EHRs. Um, this is Point Click Care, and this is from May, so it's, the colors are a little outdated. But in this EHR, you can see where it's cut off at the bottom. It will show every resident that's due for a medication. So you can see that if the resident's name appears red, that their medications are overdue. And you can also see if residents are due for medications currently. It says now, which is seven. Those usually appear in a, in a green or yellow color. So you can go in and you can see all the residents are due now and then any that are overdue. So it's really helpful so that way you're not missing anything. And you can also go in and look at the residents that are due for the next shift. So if you want to get things prepared, you're able to do that. And then, um, as Lisa mentioned earlier, there's a little lock button, and this is what the med aides will click whenever they walk away from their med cart. So it just prevents anyone from coming up and seeing any resident information or accessing anything they're not supposed to. This view is actually in a resident's chart, so you can see it, it posts all of the medications that this resident is taking, and whenever a med aide delivers the medication and the resident takes it, the med aide can go in and click Y that the medication was given or click the N that says it was not given. And one of the things that they liked about this view was there's a little heart under the medications that require a blood pressure. So before giving the medication, they will click that little heart and type in the blood pressure reading. And before giving these medications, you actually cannot click that the medication was given. So it helps prevent giving any medication that's not supposed to be given before taking the blood pressure. And another thing they liked about this view, you can see at the top left corner, it lists the resident's allergies and their code status. So if they have any allergies or if they aren't supposed to take a certain medication, it will list that up there to alert you. Um, this is the medication orders. So what they liked about this screen is it shows all of the medication orders that are currently active and you can go into any specific order and make any notes in it and it will say um, the type of order, when it was effective, the time it was effective. It will give you any data so it will tell you um, what the medication is, the instructions to give that medication and then you can save it. So anyone that goes into this report can click on any order and see if any notes are, are put in. And it also says when the start date is and then the end date. So they really liked this screen because it just showed everything in one spot. Um, some of the barriers that we found during this grant was the price per module. So when we were talking about the physicians going in and signing off in the EHR, that's a cost. You have to pay for that certain module to have that function. So because you have to pay for each module, we noticed that that led to no implementation and decreased use for med process. And of course leading to decreased physician access and HI connectivity. Another um, barrier that we noticed was any change in ownership. So if the EHR had a change in a vendor, some of the functionalities that it originally had got cut off or maybe now they're charging a fee to get that module back. So that often led to decreased use of the EHR. Well, we actually had a case where the nursing home had change in ownership. Before the new owners bought the nursing home, they had a fully functioning EHR that had the medication module. But when the new owners bought the facility, they brought their own EMR with it and they did not have medication administration as part of it. So they actually went down in their functionality of being able to use an EHR when they um, changed vendors because of the ownership. And then um, some of our homes 
weren't u utilizing an EHR or didn't have the time to implement it, so we were unable to make meaningful EHR use comparisons at that time for those homes. Um, some issues, we had some minimal to no use of EHR reporting functionality. So a lot of these EHRs, they have some good reports that you can run for your residents, and we ran into sometimes just the lack of knowledge of these reports and how to run them, so maybe some more training that needs to be done. Um, Long-term care as a home is a good thing, but it brings its own challenges. So as Lisa mentioned earlier, sometimes the physicians are not in the homes but once a week. So this often poses some barriers whenever you get a new admin with their medication list, just making sure that everything's correct. So one thing about this project um, that's beneficial is having OU because they are available at any time to come out and review those medications if the provider is not able to be in until the next week. Um, we also had an issue where there's duplication of records. So this, this happened at one home. They weren't utilizing the physician sign-off in the EHR. So the physician was coming coming to the home and signing off on paper orders. So instead of these paper orders being scanned into the EHR system, they were just filed away in the resident's paper chart. So this poses an issue because instead of having one legal record, you now have two. You have an EHR record and you have a paper record. So in any case of an audit, you want to make sure that those two records are matching up. So we want to make sure that all of those paper orders are being scanned into the electronic health record. And lastly, um, EHR focuses in long-term care is meeting CMS and CMS's MDS documentation requirements. And Lisa will get into that. Yeah, so it's that last point that uh, this article addresses. And um, it's this issue with this focus of EHRs um, that they're programmed to meet the minimum data set documentation requirements of CMS and survey and CERT. Um, whereas for primary care physicians in their private practices, they have different focus of meeting meaningful use or MACRA. Um, and so if they care for patients in long-term care, there's this sort of disconnect. And this article, um, I give you a link to this article on the, on the resource page at the end of the presentation. I just wanted to go through some of the highlights on this article. So it, it's, one of the quotes is, uh, while we, speaking of the physicians, were given incentives to purchase EHRs and satisfy meaningful use, the facilities, referring to the long-term care of the nursing homes, have had no similar incentive or obligation. Thus, we have encountered numerous challenges and hurdles specific to these places of service. Unlike office settings, we, the physicians, don't have access to support staff in nursing facilities to enter vitals, medications, allergies, lab results, and other data into our EHR. And sometimes we're asked to use the facility's EHR rather than our own. Moreover, the patients in post-acute long-term care settings have unique characteristics and care needs, but the quality measures developed for meaningful use were intended for patients in hospitals or in ambulatory settings. And some basic requ requirements, such as e-prescribing and electronic communication with patients, are irrelevant or impossible to achieve in long-term care. So a physician's practice EHR and the nursing facility's EHR often tend to be separate products with no interoperability and no functional interface. So this program forces many physicians, and this is referring to the macro, uh, forces many physicians who are able to meet meaningful use requirements and receive bonus payments from their office practice to either forego getting the bonus payment or see fewer of these patients in long-term care to ensure that they meet meaningful use requirements and remain compliant with thresholds. So this all or nothing approach to satisfying meaningful use has led the majority of eligible professionals working in post-acute long-term care to seek hardship exemptions or accept the penalties. 
Uh, under MIPS, the majority of the measures remain ambulatory care based. And physicians who see the sickest and the most expensive to care for patients in post-acute long-term care settings will continue to lose. Unfortunately, to date, much of the focus has been on various specialty societies and post-acute long-term care residents and professionals who see them have been an afterthought. So this is uh, another article that's uh, also linked at the end for your uh, thorough review. So, and uh, while acknowledging that implementing EHRs and long-term care is, is important, it doesn't come without issues as we've highlighted. And so here are a few um, excerpts from this article. From a medical record perspective, each resident is three patients, the facilities, the attending physicians, and the long-term care pharmacies. All three providers are regulated and each must answer to a set of policies and procedures mandated without consideration of respective needs in a shared electronic record environment. Under state medical board regulations, CMS re reimbursement rules, and tort law, physicians are required to maintain a clinical record for each patient for whom they provide care. This record must be produced on demand. If the physician's only record is maintained at the facility, subject to facility control, the physician may be unable to produce legally required documents on demand. There are several examples of physician groups subject to CMS claims audits that were required to make audit repayment because the facility could not retrieve archived copies of records. Long-term post-acute care facility software evolved to address federal and state compliance mandates of conditions of participation, MDS reporting, and documentation required to support billing and audits. Software for the nursing home is not designed around the documentation needs of the long-term post-acute care physician or extender. The entire concept is different. Facility software is built around the incredibly detailed CMS survey and certification process. So some of our recommendations while working in this grant is to utilize your EHR for the full use in the medication process. Um, like some of our barriers and stuff we noticed earlier, documentation and ordering can be very beneficial in an EHR. You can use alerts, e-prescribing straight to the pharmacy, and you can also use it for any reporting and tracking progress for your residents. And of course, just be careful, make sure there's no paper duplication so that way you have just one legal record instead of two. Some additional recommendations is to connect to an HIE. This will help when your residents are transferred to another healthcare setting. Um, use a clinical pharmacist consultant for transfers. So if you have a new admit, this clinical pharmacist can be very, very beneficial to come in and do a med reconciliation for you. And include your post-acute and long-term care operators and practitioners in shared saving programs and align incentive programs under MACRA and the IMPACT Act. So that last recommendation is really more for the government to, to align those programs. Um, this is the resource page we were referring to. Um, I'll just go through these briefly. Leading Age is the professional association for not-for-profit long-term care facilities, and there are a lot of great resources on their site. But pertinent to, to today's topic, I'd like to call your attention to their Center for Aging Services Technologies, or CAST. And in particular, their EHR portfolio, which has uh, 26 vendors included. This includes a product selection matrix, a selection tool, and some case studies related to EHR, clinical decision support, interoperability, health information exchange adoption, and lessons learned in long-term care. The Stratus Health site includes tools related to HIT planning, selection, implementation, and optimization. The issue brief covers some background, use of HIT, opportunities and resources for long-term care. 
The Post Acute Care HIT website is a collaborative focus on HIT issues and hosts, they do host an annual conference. Here are the links to the two articles I mentioned. And finally, Jerry Tech is a blog by Dr. Leslie Kernison, a San Francisco based geriatrician. It combines her love of geriatrics and technology and is always a really interesting read. You should uh, be able to download a copy of the PowerPoint presentation and these links are all in there on this resource page. So lastly, we wanted to show this video just so you guys can know the um, technology used in a, in a patient or resident's care. So in this video, you'll note some of the technology such as a virtual visit that's used through, a, um, through an iPad and you also know the use of an HIE across the different healthcare settings. So just know all of the different technologies and how this can truly benefit a patient or a resident throughout their healthcare treatment. And in the notes uh, section of this uh, PowerPoint slide is a link to the video also if you uh, want to view it separately at another time. My name is Alma Jones. I've been living here in my apartment for 20 years. I love it. I have some great friends. I do what I want, when I want. My great granddaughter, Danielle, she's the light of my life. My goodness. I teach her how to bake and she teaches me how to Google. And now it's me, my daughter, my granddaughter and her daughter. We're four generations strong. I'm so proud. I have my aches and pains for sure, but I never thought I'd live on my own in my 80s. When I was a home health nurse, we used to see patients for a 30 minute session and then they were on their home or sent to a nursing home. But look at me, I'm making my own coffee in my own kitchen. Speaking about coffee, I hate seeing my mom get old, but I think what impresses me most about her aging is that she's taken charge of it. She's had electronic records of her medical history and her current medications created so we don't have to sift through a lot of paperwork. She had to get a new doctor once, right? You always have to get all the old history and give it to the new doctor. Well, we didn't have to worry about all that. She had everything on. Mom? 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 Where's my phone? Danielle, bring me my phone! I think Grandma had a stroke. Hello, ladies. How are you? So-so. Okay. Mm -hmm. Feel a little bit better than when you got here? Alma Stroke has left her weak on her right side and she's having difficulty walking. Again? Because Alma's in a care network, we had her entire electronic medical record when she arrived. We knew her conditions, medications, and allergies. It helped pinpoint the right treatment for her stroke. We even knew what medications she took last and when from her medication adherence record. It probably saved her life. Our goal is a plan that gets Alma back to normal living at home and avoiding a rehospitalization. Here he is. This is David. He's going to get you set up with rehab. Thank you. You take care. Thank you. Hi. Hi, David. You're all set. Your primary care doctor and the rehab center, they have all your information. And I hear they're holding a room facing the garden for you. Oh, that's so <laughs> nice. Y'all move fast. Back in my day, a patient would show up with a six-inch thick folder in their lap, 
and it wouldn't be till then that rehab people could start their work. <laughs> well, let me grab that wheelchair for you, okay? Thank you All so right. much. Sure. Uh, well, we received Alma's records from Dr. Rodriguez and activated a care plan for her. It monitors and reports her progress to everyone in the network. Okay, Alma, we're going to start another session. Remember what to do, right? Mm-hmm. The physical therapy regimen will have her home soon. Um, once she's there, her care plan consists of three components. One, telehealth. Alma's doctors will be able to monitor her remotely. Two, in-home sensors to detect if she's declining or needs assistance. And three, a sleep monitor. This really helps us detect problems early. Oh, in addition, Alma will have a personal emergency response system that can automatically detect falls. These systems help alert her caregivers right away. This really is the future of aging. I think it's time for your telehealth appointment with Dr. Okay. Lane. Okay. Let me get him for you. Let's look, it's Dr. Lane. Hi, Alma. Hey, Suzanne. How are you feeling, Alma? I'm happy to be home, but I'm a little tired. And my arthritis is, is acting up and it's keeping me awake. Now, can we try an naproxen for it? Yes, I see from your monitoring data that your sleep has been disrupted. I wish I could give you naproxen for your arthritis, but I see here they started you on a blood thinner in the hospital. Unfortunately, blood thinners and naproxen are a dangerous combination. The system red flagged me when I entered the prescription. Also, I'd like to start you in more physical therapy. Your home health agency transferred over your motion data from your home monitor, and you should be moving a lot more than you are. What do you think of that? Well, that sounds great. Uh, there's one other thing bothering me, and I, I just want to say it. I, I hate relying on Suzanne for so much. I keep telling her to take that vacation she's been planning. Mom. You know, Suzanne, you should go on that vacation. You can log in remotely to check on your mom as many times as you like. And the home care agency will be there for her. Well, doctor, I think I'll take you up on that. <laughs> Having the time of my life, wish you were here. Miss you and love you, Mom, Suzanne. It's a miracle sitting here with you, with my plants and my great-granddaughter. I never imagined the way my care team, the doctors, the hospital, my rehab center, the home care agency, how they all communicate with each other so they can give me better care. All this technology made the impossible possible. Now I'm not afraid to be alone. I'm not afraid at all. <laughs>